Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I saw the show of hands for extra class hams. How many hams are in the audience here, just generally? Oh, wow, fantastic. Okay, uh, I feel right at home. Uh, I'm not a communications engineer. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, and, and my experience with new radio is just uh, kind of dabbling with it as, as a hobbyist with SDR play and actually put together a little single sideband uh, decoder uh, to play with for ham radio. So, so that's my experience there. But what I want to talk to you about is uh, uh, what was going on 50 years ago now was, um, of course, uh, 50 years ago in July was the anniversary of the uh, Apollo 11 uh, mission. And uh, unless you were living in a cave somewhere, you couldn't have missed that. It was on all the, all the media outlets and everything. <laughs> and um, we had a, a special event operation, uh, kind of a NASA-wide one uh, for amateur radio. But uh, it's kind of nice to look back and see how this was done. Uh, it, it always amazes me as we are, are uh, trying to um, you know, develop the capability to get back to the moon now, and I'll talk about that at the end of the discussion here. Uh, looking back and seeing how they did it 50 years ago just never ceases to amaze me. Um, <clears throat> there was, uh, uh, you know, the technology back then was, was totally different and, uh, uh, you know, not nearly as capable, but um, let's see, let me move along to the next slide here. So, uh, of course, this is a big deal uh, here in Huntsville because we built the Saturn V here. We, I didn't. I was 14 years old at the time. Uh, but that's uh, one of our great legacies here in Huntsville, and we're building the next great rocket as well, the, the space launch system that I'll talk about. And so what we were seeing 50 years ago was this. All right, so that's what we saw and what we heard 50 years ago. And uh, I started researching this to figure out how did they do it? You know, what, what was the, the, the hardware? What uh, bands were they using? And that's what I'll, I'll talk about today. Uh, the uh, uh, kind of the rough outline here is we'll talk about how the audio got back. And uh, the key is USB, and that is not upper sideband, as you'll see. Uh, they'll talk about uh, some amateur radio involvement here. We call this extreme shortwave listening. It wasn't shortwave, it was S-band, but uh, extreme S-band listening by hams. Uh, and talk about some of the options for the comms. Something that you may have noticed in that uh, clip right there was that that was uh, Armstrong and Aldrin on the surface, and of course they were talking to Mission Control, but then you heard them also talking to uh, Mike Collins, uh, who was in the uh, command service module orbiting around the moon at the time. And uh, so I'll talk about kind of how that was done, what some of the architecture there was. Uh, how we got uh, color video uh, out of that, uh, uh, that really uh, grainy, uh, awful looking black and white there. And then uh, I'll talk about what our plans are for the future, uh, what, what we're going to do next. So let me see if I can do this. First of all, the, one of the iconic things that, that we all remember, and anytime somebody's kind of simulating, uh, uh, you know, uh, air-to-ground communication, they always put the beep in there, right? So that's called a Quindar tone. And that's the name of the company who developed this, is these Quindar tones. And um, <clears throat> they, uh, they were used really just push to talk. That was the idea. So there was, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the ranging capability of the, uh, the system in a moment, but uh, because they wanted to keep a continuous carrier going up to the command service module, uh, they had to keep the, um, and they didn't want the uh, Capcom and Mission Control to be live all the time going through that system. They had this tone system called uh, Quindar Tones, and so when he pushed to talk on his headset uh, in Mission Control, the intro tone went out, and then when he released the push to talk, the outro tone went out. And so that way they were able to, to keep that line um, uh, going, keep that uh, audio going, but not have a live mic for him all the time. And let's see if we can play this here. The intro tone 
is that uh, 25, 25 hertz. And the outro was 50 hertz lower. You can tell the difference there between the, the intro and the outro. So that was just used to key the, um, the ground stations, which could have been as uh, far away from uh, Mission Control as Australia, uh, to tell them, okay, now take the audio coming from Mission Control and send it up. Uh, so that's all that was. Um, this uh, S-band carrier was, as I mentioned, sent up uh, uh, kind of constantly so they would uh, be able to do ranging, and they used a pseudo-random -ran number code for the ranging. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along here. All right, so the uh, Snoopy cap is uh, what the astronauts use there. And you can see the, what the inside looked like, a couple of headsets, uh, and then uh, the, uh, the two boom mics. And you can see why they were called Snoopy hats uh, at the time. Snoopy, uh, of course, in the, um, the Peanuts comic strip was very popular back, uh, back in that time period. Uh, I, I did hear, I listened to um, a lot of the, uh, the audio and the, kind of the full uh, mission audio while they were on the surface of the moon during the anniversary uh, through this uh, Apollo in real time. Anybody else familiar with that? Anybody else try that out? Yeah, that, that was extremely cool, and it's still out there. I, I have a link for it at the end here. Uh, so on that, uh, the, the July 20th, that evening, um, you could listen in real time of what was happening exactly 50 years ago. And so I watched the whole EVA, and I remember Aldrin, they kept having a hard time hearing him from time to time. And so uh, he finally said, well, one of these microphones is in my mouth, and I can't do anything about it. You know, it was kind of... You know, you can't take your helmet off, obviously, when you're on the surface there to, to move it. So they had the two mics, and uh, so that was uh, the audio from, to and from the crew. So this USB, that's Unified S-Band System. Now, what they'd had before this, uh, according to my uh, little historical research, during Mercury and Gemini programs, they used HF, VHF, UHF. They kind of had, uh, and, and C-Band for tracking, uh, radar transponders for tracking. So they had all these different radios, all these different systems on the spacecraft. And uh, some of them were telemetry, some of them were, were for audio. And um, so they decided with Apollo, they needed something uh, smaller and lighter. You're going all the way to the moon. You know, you don't want to carry all, you know, a whole bunch of different radios with you. So they came up with this unified S-band system that sort of did all of it. It had voice, uh, digital, uh, the ranging signals um, <clears throat> from the ground to the spacecraft. And his spacecraft to ground, you know, they included telemetry, t TV, uh, the biomed data. Uh, they had an emergency voice channel and even an emergency key. They could do CW. They could do Morse code if they needed to. They only tested it, I think, on Apollo 7. Fortunately, they never needed it. But if they'd had some other problems with antenna pointing or something like that, they, they actually could, uh, could do uh, Morse code. Uh, they were able to communicate with the command module. That was where most of the, the data, uh, of course, uh, flowed from. The lunar module and uh, the Saturn S4B. I should mention that all of this uh, information here is from a NASA technical memo, and it was actually a conference paper back in 1966 that describes this system. And uh, if you want to look that up, you can uh, probably, uh-oh, what happened? Oh, we have, oh, we have a loss of signal there. Um, you can look that up and, and uh, read more detail about how this works. And I want to challenge you guys. I don't know a whole lot about GNU Radio and how you use it in academia, but this would make a very cool class project, I think, to tell the students, use these modern tools that you have, these modern software tools, and just simulate this whole S-band, unified S-band system. So I'll just throw that out there as a, a challenge of something you may want to try. Uh, I kept thinking as I was reading about how they did all this stuff with uh, you know, analog circuitry, uh, how much easier it would be today. All right, so that's what it looked like. Uh, that was uh, one of the radios. You can see a little scale there. I think that's a six inch scale. Uh, so it's fairly small, but uh, uh, packed, a lot of information packed there. That was based on a design that the, um, I think Jet Propulsion Lab had uh, kind of come up with for uh, some of the unmanned spacecraft. Uh, Goddard was involved, Collins Radio, uh, Motorola, uh, some of the big names were involved in that. I don't know why we keep losing. Okay. Yeah, maybe that's it. That's right. We're, we're in LOS. Okay, it's over here. So, well, all right. Um, yeah, there, there, there's our modern technology for us, right? 
All right, so both the spacecraft had uh, a lot of antennas on them. You can see there, there were Omni antennas body mounted uh, on the command service module. And um, I'm going to try to avoid using the pointer too much because there's so much action here. But there's some Omni antennas out there. Uh, you can see the, um, the, the big, uh, the four uh, bay dish uh, antenna there. Um, and of course, that was for the high rate data. The lunar module had uh, Omni antennas. It also had VHF antennas, and that was used during the EVAs, during the moonwalks, to talk to the, the crew so they could relay their signals back to Earth. And um, so there's some VHF antennas there, uh, an S-band high gain antenna uh, on the uh, lunar module um, up here, and then they had a, a radar antenna as well that they used for the, uh, uh, the rendezvous uh, when they uh, linked back up with the command service module and before they left the moon. All right, the ground antennas, there were two classes of those. There was a 30-foot uh, dish and an 85-foot dish, both Cassegrains. And you can see the gains and the beam widths there and the acquisition antennas. Uh, but um, I think the interesting thing is they were 20-kilowatt uh, uh, transmitters, used klystrons. Um, there you can see the, the preamps, parametric amplifiers, and the frequencies, S-band, uh, about uh, 2.1 gigahertz. Uh, th there were subcarriers that were used, and we'll see a picture of this in a moment of, um, of where they put the voice and the data, uh, but those are the, the different subcarriers. And um, you can see with the, um, uh, th this is uplink, of course, but the downlink is very similar. Uh, they had a one kilohertz sync tone, and they had this uh, sine wave biphase modulated. I guess we're still using something kind of like that uh, these days. And then the ranging code. And this uh, looked to me like, um, uh, reminded me a whole lot of either radar or, or GPS, you know, where you have this pseudo-random number code. And what they did here is they, they modulated the, um, uh, the S-band signal with this, and they had two different ones, a uh, 70 millisecond one when they were in close to the Earth, and then a 5.4 second one, uh, which, uh, you know, repeated every 5.4 four seconds. Well, the range time to the moon is only one and a half seconds, or round trips about three seconds. So uh, they could have used this even farther out past the moon without ambiguity. So there's this uh, this PRN code uh, that was transmitted up, and then they just turned around and transmitted it back down. And by correlating those on the ground, they could figure out how far away the the spacecraft was uh, to within a few meters. I think is is what I read there. So that's uh, that's pretty accurate. Um, also the um, Carrier was, uh, they had a, a phase lock loop and then, you know, used that to, to generate the signal coming back to Earth. And by, by tracking the, uh, the frequency of that carrier, they were able to get the range rate uh, to within, I think it was, uh, of, you know, 10 centimeters per second or something like that. So the very precise range and range rate. And then, of course, they had the AZL uh, from the, the ground tracking antenna. So with that information, and assuming ballistic uh, trajectory, you know, that that's how they tracked uh, to the moon. So um, very, uh, uh, very simple but uh, clever uh, process. <clears throat> All right, that's what one of the 85-foot ground stations looked like in Australia. And now here's the, the spectrum of the downlink. And uh, I will have to kind of point at this a little bit. There's the carrier. It was a phase-modulated carrier. And in the, um, this document, this TM uh, technical memo document, talks about they tried to keep the modulation index kind of low so you had a nice, strong carrier to lock on to. They didn't want to uh, um, uh, you know, lose the carrier and all the other uh, signal there. Um, and you can see the... Uh, the voice and telemetry subcarriers, they tried to put that pretty close to one of the nulls there uh, in the, uh, the, the PRN code uh, modulation. And then they had these other modes where they could kind of turn off the, the tracking um, uh, PRN code and uh, just have the, the television and then the voice and the telemetry, or they could turn every, all, everything off except for the voice. And then here is that CW, the Morse code, uh, 512 kilohertz. Uh, subcarrier they could use just for emergency key, they, they called it. So the voice, we got things like that. And I think also uh, in the voice uh, signal was the biomedical data. So this is the heart rate of Buzz Aldrin uh, as they were on the moon. And that's the, the telemetry, of course, that came back, all the information that uh, 
uh, as you saw Apollo 13, everything that went, the screens went blank or they lost all the data, you know, when they uh, uh, lost uh, COM after the explosion. And then the tracking, uh, talked about that. And of course the video, and then that uh, emergency key. So that's all of the, the information that was just packed into that one S-band signal. Now the spacecraft uh, uh, radio characteristics, it used a traveling wave tube, TWT, uh, 20 watts was a primary mode. They also had a, what hams call a QRP mode. They could run five watts uh, if they needed to. And in, uh, we talked about the antennas already. There's all the, the frequencies. And it's interesting, they, they used this um, uh, 240 divided by 221 as the ratio of the uplink to the downlink. And so they had that uh, kind of wired in uh, very carefully so that they could use the Doppler to figure out the, uh, um, you know, the velocity of the spacecraft. And there's the info on the um, uh, voice and telemetry subcarriers and the television that I'll talk about a little bit more. All right, of course, uh, hams had to get into the act here, and, and uh, radio amateurs have for a long time done uh, uh, the, really the extreme part of ham radio is, is called uh, moon bounce or earth, moon, earth. And this is simply bouncing a communication signal off the moon, just having it scattered off the moon. It was all done with Morse code. Um, back in the day, it's done with digital modes now, something called JT65 uh, is, is very popular for that kind of thing. But the guys who were, who were ready to do this back in the 60s and 70s thought, well, let's see if we can hear the, the radios from Apollo. And so there were two of them that published uh, in this uh, QST, that's the uh, uh, Amateur Radio, uh, uh, American Radio Relay League, AWRL. I'm not an AWRL member, I should remember that. That's their main magazine. So back in 1972, they had this uh, article <coughs> about how two hams actually heard Apollo 15, the command service module. Um, and, and both of them, if you go through and read the account there, ARRL members can, can go look at the archives and, and find this magazine here, June 72, and read about this. It's fascinating. Both of them kind of independently did this, and neither of them were expecting to hear the signal, and they didn't have their tape recorders running, so they weren't able to record it. They just heard it kind of come through the speaker all of a sudden and then got more intentional about it later. Uh, so that's who they heard. Um, that was uh, Al Warden, uh, who was on the command service module, the command module pilot. And uh, so the, the two were K2RIW and W4HHK. And um, I, I love this, um, this one here, the antenna feed, was a, an American paint can and a Scottish oatmeal can. Now, I don't know, there's something magical, I guess, about the dimensions of a Scottish oatmeal can. Uh, how he came by that, I'm not really sure. Uh, but to build the antenna feed. And um, so uh, both of them had kind of similar, you know, big dishes with, uh, with their feeds there. And they said that the um, uh, command module at the time was, uh, it was about 13 watts. So they were able to hear 13 watts at uh, S-band with these big dishes. So here's a block diagram of, of uh, K2 IRW system, and uh, I'll zoom in a little bit here and show you that, uh, you know, there's, there's a parametric amplifiers and spectrum analyzers and all kinds of stuff in there, but there's an Amico 2 meter converter, uh, which uh, I know a lot of hams used at the time, a Drake receiver, and a modified Knight receiver, so it's good to see some good old uh, ham gear uh, in, in the system here. Now, they tried, uh, uh, again, with Apollo 16, uh, you know, kind of from the success of this, and, and it's really amazing what was accomplished here. First of all, they were able to detect the lunar module carrier, and from the Doppler, these guys could measure, could tell when it sat down on the surface, when it quit moving. Now, there, your conspiracy theorist would have to explain that. I guess that could have been fake, too, right? You know, we could have sent a spacecraft to, to do the same kind of thing. But uh, that's pretty amazing they were able to do that. They also detected the uplink signal, this 20 kilowatt signal coming from these big dishes. They detected that scattered from the moon. So this is the moon bounce thing. Well, you know, hams can only do, what, one and a half kilowatts. And so um, they were able to, you know, they were doing moon bounce back, uh, back in that time frame uh, with one and a half kilowatts. So it seemed like, I guess, that's pretty easy to do with 20 kilowatt uh, uplink. 
And then there's a, um, a one watt signal from the ALSEP scientific packages. This is what each of the Apollo uh, crews left on the surface of the moon uh, that were seismometers. And oh, I've got a picture of it here in a minute. I won't go through all that. But they were able to detect that one watt signal coming from those things. So I think that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, so that's what the ALSEPs look like. They had uh, little uh, radioisotope thermoelectric generators on them uh, to run the seismometers and magnetometers, and you can see all the other uh, instruments there. Um, and so, and there's the, uh, the S-band antenna there pointed at the Earth, one watt, and they detected that. So pretty, pretty amazing. All right, so there was a lot of reconfigurability uh, in the system. Uh, just in case they had problems or they needed to do something a little bit different. Uh, and th these are just a few of the options here. So they could use VHF to talk between the lunar module and the command service module. Uh, full duplex, you know, two different frequencies. And then uh, if they needed to uh, talk to the command service module when it was below the horizon, uh, they could do that through the Earth, so S-band up to Earth and then out to the command service module. And uh, think about this for a second. Each leg of this took one and a half seconds, and so you've got four hops essentially here, so there's six seconds that's a uh, delay uh, that you'd have to, have to deal with. <coughs> and then uh, there's the uh, VHF com um, between the crew members the limb, and then that was uh, sent back up and, and back down, uh, you know, from the S-band system. I, I noticed that uh, I think Apollo 11, they did not deploy one of these kind of dishes here. And, and, and again, in listening to the, um, uh, to the real, <laughs> near, <laughs> the 50 year plus uh, real time audio, uh, I, I did hear Armstrong ask, do you have a good TV signal? And what he was asking was, essentially, do I need to bother setting up this antenna? And they were getting enough uh, uh, video, and of course it, it wasn't great, it was that slow scan, oops, back up, um, kind of grainy stuff. That was coming through the S-band antenna on the lunar module, not one of these dishes here. Now with Apollo 12, they switched to that kind of dish. Uh, I don't know if you remember Apollo 12, they kind of accidentally pointed the camera at the sun, and that was the end of video from, uh, from that mission. Um, and, um, uh, but they did have that dish set up and we got a little, little bit of video uh, kind of early on. And then there's all this, once they had the, the lunar rover, which was also developed here at Marshall, uh, they had the additional communications capability. It had its own S-band dish and um, could uh, send video back uh, as well as the, uh, you know, repeat the VHF audio from the crew. All right, so how did they do that video? Well, it was this uh, um, ancient uh, Viticon technology. Uh, I think the camera on the left there uh, in the guy's right hand is the onboard. And uh, I saw a picture of the back of it, and I think that actually had a monitor on it so they could see what they were, were looking at. Uh, and of course, that was a CRT type monitor back then. And then the one in, um, on, on our right there is the um, surface camera, and that's what was used um, you know, to show us the, uh, the, the video from the, um, uh, from the surface of the moon. Uh, the Apollo 11 video was, uh, it was all black and white, 10 frames per second, slow scan, so that kept the data rate down, kept the bandwidth down, only 320 lines. And then to get standard video that they could distribute then to uh, all the news outlets so that, um, uh, you know, Walter Cronkite could, uh, could share the, the video with us, uh, they actually had a camera looking at the screen on a ground station that was looking at the slow scan 10 frame per second thing. They recorded it to a magnetic disc and replayed it five times each to get the 30 frames per second or 60 fields per second of standard video. So um, uh, just amazing to think that you had a camera looking at a monitor and this disc and doing all this shenanigans uh, to get us some standard video. Um, pretty clever. All right, so we saw uh, black and white from um, Apollo 11 and uh, 12. I can't remember when the color came in. I think maybe um, 12 might have even been a color camera, but how would they get the color from uh, a, a black and white Viticon? Well, TV cameras of that day were pretty big and they had um, 
three different Viticons and color filters in front of them. They use uh, beam splitters, so they take you know, the light coming in and uh, split it up into three colors and uh, run it through some optics into these, uh, these Viticons, and then you'd have the red, green, and blue signals coming out. And that obviously was not going to work for sending into space because you would have probably had to leave one of the crew members behind if you were carrying something that big with you. And keeping all of that stuff aligned with all the launch loads and vibrations, I'm sure, would have been really tough. So they came up with this, uh, this scheme where you spin a color filter wheel in front of the black and white camera and um, uh, they had two red, two green, two blue filters running at 10 revolutions per second. That ends up giving you the, the 60 uh, fields per second that you want. And that was a wider bandwidth signal. And uh, the, this report said that they had to do significant filtering to keep that from interfering with the, uh, the other S-band uh, components, all the telemetry and ranging and all that stuff. So a lot of analog filtering going on. Then they used videotape to correct the video sync for Doppler. Obviously, these spacecraft are moving. You know, the video sync signal is moving along. Uh, and, and so they used a, um, a videotape uh, a system for that. And then another magnetic disc recorder to uh, spin at the proper rate there, recorded the R, G, and B on six separate tracks, and then they read them back simultaneously to generate the color. And so I th that's so clever to to come up with, uh, with that kind of thing. And I'm not sure if you can tell exactly there, but if you look very carefully, you can kind of tell that thing was, was spinning. Now this is one of the lunar rover videos of the launch of the ascent module back up from the surface. And if you look right here, there's a blue, green, and red. So that was some piece of debris that was blown off the upper stage, or I mean the, the lower stage, uh, the descent uh, module uh, as the engine ignited and you can kind of see that there's uh, you know blue green and red here so that particle was moving fast enough that you captured it in one color filter uh, at one point and in the next color filter at the next point and the next one at the next point so you, you can kind of tell how that worked there so it was fine for guys walking around the surface but uh, um, for very dynamic events like that uh, uh, you, know, you, you, you see some artifacts obviously so you can tell that's how it worked. I think they used something similar to this on shuttle during the early days. They must have gone to CCDs at some point, but because um, I remember seeing some kind of dynamic events of some you know, piece of junk floating away from the shuttle and seeing the red, green, blue components of it. So uh, I think that was used uh, early on in shuttle. So uh, you, you need uh, you know, that wider bandwidth, you need better signal of the S band, uh, and they had this deployable um, antenna uh, that they could set up on the surface and then when they had the lunar rover starting with Apollo 15 uh, they had the little antenna and every time they stopped parked the rover they had to get out and point that antenna back up toward the earth and um, uh, and then the ground could take control of the camera you can see the camera right there they always kind of pointed it down and back to keep the dust off of it but still you would see them during most of these EVAs pull out a paintbrush and and dust the, the dust off the lens uh, so that uh, you know, we get a good view from Earth. But the, the ground controllers could pan, tilt, and zoom uh, that camera and watch the crew uh, as they were walking around. I was strolling on the moon one day in a very, very month of December. Now, May, May, when they much to my surprise, a pair of bunny eyes. Doop, 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 doop. Oh, this is a neat way to travel. Isn't that great? Sort of panning and zooming here from Earth. I like to skip along, but me, boy, skip. It's amazing. <laughs> what an amazing time that was. All right, so that's what the... the uh, lunar surface assets look like, and I, I don't remember which mission. This could be 11. Um, there's the camera that was looking back uh, at the, uh, uh, the lander and the um, you know, part of the ALSEP system there. So that was then, and uh, we were, um, uh, you know, just lasted, well, I guess from 1969, uh, the plaque on the left there is the one from Apollo 11. 
your men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969 A.D. We came in peace for all mankind. And then Apollo 17, in uh, December of 1972, here man completed his first explorations of the moon, December 1972 A.D. May the spirit of peace in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. And we haven't been back yet, and that's kind of a shame. Uh, we've had uh, a few uh, fits and starts here uh, with different administrations of saying, let's go back to the moon. Uh, we've got a pretty, pretty good head of steam now, but uh, it, it all depends on the political will and, and the funding and all that. But uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about what our plans are for returning to the moon now. Uh, the program is called Artemis. And I've, I've got a video here at the end. They'll probably talk about this, but that's the twin sister of Apollo. That's pretty cool. Um, and um, uh, our, our plans are to have boots on the moon is the direction that we were given by 2024. That's pretty ambitious. We have the rocket. We have the capsule. Uh, the lander is under development now. And uh, we're not there yet uh, by any means, but... Uh, I've never seen NASA move so fast on something, I'll tell you. It's, it's been uh, dizzying, the, the speed at which we're doing this. So back in December of 2017, there was a space policy directed, uh, from the, directed from the White House to return to the moon and onto Mars. And the plan at the time was by 2028, uh, get to the moon. Then uh, in March, uh, Vice President Pence was here for the uh, was National Space Council and uh, right over here at the Space and Rocket Center and said, okay, we want you to do it by 2024 and uh, to land humans near the lunar south pole. And I'll talk about why that's interesting um, in a moment. The, you, you can do these, you know, go back in a hurry and land and, you know, put down the flag and take pictures and, and uh, uh, you know, one small step and all that kind of stuff. But the idea here is to make this sustainable so that we can keep doing it, that we don't just do these little camping uh, trips and, uh, you know, real, real quick ones. And so I'll tell you a little bit about the, um, uh, the architecture for doing that. Uh, it will be done with something called Gateway, which you'll see in a moment, and the human, la human landing system. Uh, which may have uh, multiple elements to it. Um, we're, I think there's getting ready to be some uh, contracts let here in the, in the near future. There's already some studies going on by contractors, but there may be a transfer, descent, and ascent elements. Uh, and they'll all be aggregated or kind of assembled at this gateway. And then hopefully the ascent element will be reusable, refuelable, and maybe even the transfer element too. The space launch system that we're developing now uh, which will be more powerful than the Saturn V. Uh, uh, and this Orion capsule will ferry the crew and some of the hardware, and then there will be commercial launches to uh, transport some of the hardware and the logistics. So that, that's kind of in the planning right now. Remember Apollo, the way we did that was put it all on one rocket. So you had the command service module and the lunar module all stacked up there and uh, send it all at one time, and so all of your uh, capability was, was sent at once. And the idea here with um, uh, the Space Launch System and uh, Gateway is to uh, send those pieces individually and uh, assemble them in lunar orbit. Uh, so SLS, uh, this may look familiar. That's kind of like an external tank on steroids uh, from the shuttle, uh, just bigger. And uh, we're testing those elements right now uh, out at Marshall, uh, doing structural tests on them. The uh, boosters on the side here are like shuttle solid rocket boosters, only longer. They've got an extra segment in them to, to make them more powerful. And the engines are shuttle main engines, kind of upgraded a bit, but there'll be four of them instead of three. So with all of this stuff, you get the extra power you need to get to the moon. There's an upper stage here. Uh, this initially will be based on the Delta cryogenic second stage, the DCSS. It's called the interim cryopropulsion stage here, but uh, there's also uh, development going on now for the exploration upper stage, which is a more powerful version of an upper stage. And up on top of it, the capsule, the Orion, and the service module, and the European Space Agency is providing that uh, service module. So those are the pieces. That's what Orion looks like. Now this shape may look really familiar to you. This is exactly the same aspect ratio, I guess you'd call it, or outer mold line uh, shape as the Apollo capsule. I remember when they started development of this, they started looking around, what's the best shape to use for 
uh, you know, re-entering from the moon at these very high speeds. And it turned out that what they came up with for Apollo was pretty doggone good. So they stuck with that, that kind of shape. It's bigger. Um, uh, it'll carry four crew members and uh, it can stay a whole lot longer uh, at, the, um, uh, at the moon. It has solar panels instead of the fuel cells, which kind of had limited lifetime uh, on Apollo. Uh, they run out of hydrogen and oxygen. So you get much longer stay times with, uh, with this uh, hardware. And then that's what the gateway and the lander looks like. And the gateway portion is this. There's a uh, power and propulsion element, which has these big solar rays, and that'll have ion engines on it. So they'll be able to test that technology uh, for uh, changing the orbit uh, around the moon with that. Uh, and then there's uh, something called a mini-hab here um, that is sort of a pass-through to go from a logistics module. So that's, uh, you know, hardware and... Um, uh, food and you know all the consumables that will be brought up on a, a commercial launcher and um, then this is what the lander looks like kind of vaguely reminiscent of the, the lunar module but a whole lot bigger um, there is this transfer element that you need to get from the orbit that gateway is in which is is called a near rectilinear halo orbit it's a very eccentric orbit around the moon 75,000 kilometer apolloon um, so it'll be in that orbit. It doesn't take so much energy to get to that orbit. So it's kind of easier to assemble the, um, the hardware uh, there. And then you use this stage uh, to get from that orbit down to low lunar orbit and land. There's the, uh, the descent module. So it'll have uh, the legs on it, you know, to sit down on the surface. And an ascent module. And that's where the crew will be. And that's the part that comes back up and, and docks with the, uh, the gateway. And then the crew can climb in Orion and come home, bring the moon rocks home and uh, uh, all of that kind of thing. So that's the idea. Now, Gateway Phase 2, after the 2024, would look like this. And that actually, whoops, that actually has a, uh, a habitat modules in it. So you can have crew there for quite a while, um, uh, uh, several weeks at a time, uh, maybe up to a month, I think, is, is what, what they're talking about. The idea of that is you don't really need that to get to the moon, but that's probably what a Mars vehicle is going to look like, very similar to that, uh, with an ion engine on the back of it and habitat modules and a capsule. Now, you probably have to send a, a, you know, some kind of um, ascent uh, hardware uh, to Mars ahead, but the idea is not just to get to the moon with this hardware, but to also test out the technologies you need to get to Mars. And that's what the lander might look like sitting on the south pole of the moon. Now, it, it always bothers me. I'm an astronomer by training. And you see these pictures from the moon, and there's, there's the Earth hanging right down near the horizon. And you don't see that from the Apollo sites. It's always up high in the sky because of the, you know, the the way the moon's tidally locked to the Earth. But in this case, we will have these kind of views because the plan is to land at the South Pole. Uh, both the uh, South Pole and the North Pole have permanently shadowed regions. And these are craters. This is a lighting map based on Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, which is a spacecraft that's been operating since 2009, I think, in, in orbit around the moon. Um, I'm pointing at this one because it's a little darker over there, so I, I hope you guys over there can, can see what's going on. Um, these, uh, uh, so, so LRO has been making measurements. It has an altimeter, and they build these digital elevation models, and then they uh, fly the moon around the, uh, uh, the Earth and, and look at how the sunlight shines on it. And the bright areas are regions that get a whole lot of sunlight throughout the year. And the dark regions don't get any sunlight. So when you get to the South Pole, because of the moon's orbit, it's very low inclination, and the, the, the moon is only tilted about one and a half degrees from its orbit, there are regions that never see any sunlight. And there's very good evidence that there's water mixed in with the regolith, mixed in with the, the, the moon dirt there. And so when, you're, when you have water, and you can mine that, and that's no easy trick because it's so cold, it's about 30 or 40 degrees above absolute zero Kelvin in these, uh, these craters. But if you can get that water out and use some solar energy, you can crack the water into hydrogen and oxygen, there's rocket fuel. So that's the idea, is to, to go to a place 
where there may be resources that we can actually use there. Um, and the South Pole is right around in here, I think, right along there. So it'll be somewhere in that vicinity, but possibly on that ridge or somewhere nearby where that first landing occurs. All right, now I have a video here. I think that this. Fifty years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed cut through the fictions of science and showed us all what was possible. Today, our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. See if you recognize we must overcome the, the narrator radiation, too. isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024, and this is how. This all starts with the ability to get larger, heavier payloads off planet and beyond Earth's gravity. For this, we design an entirely new rocket. A space launch system. SLS will be the most powerful rocket ever developed. And with components in production. And more in testing. This system is capable of being the catalyst for deep space missions. We need a capsule that can support humans from launch through deep space and return safely back to Earth. For this, we've built Orion. This is NASA's next generation human space capsule. Using data from lunar orbiters that continue to reveal the moon's hazards and resources, we're currently developing an entirely new approach to landing and operating on the moon. Using our commercial partners to deliver science instruments and robotics to the surface, we are paving the way for human missions in 2024. Our charge is to go quickly and to stay, to press our collective efforts forward with a fervor that will see us return to the moon in a manner that is wholly different than 50 years ago. We want lunar landers that are reusable, that can land anywhere on the lunar surface. The simplest way to do so is to give them a platform in orbit around the moon from which to transition. An orbiting platform to host deep space experiments and be a waypoint for human capsules. We call this lunar outpost Gateway. The beauty of the Gateway is that it can be moved between orbits. It will balance between the Earth and Moon's gravity. In a position that is ideal for launching even deeper space missions. In 2009, we learned that the Moon contains millions of tons of water ice. This ice can be extracted and purified for water. It can be separated in oxygen for breathing or hydrogen for rocket fuel. The moon is quite uniquely suited to prepare us and propel us to Mars and beyond. This is what we're building. This is what we're training for. This we can replicate throughout the solar system. This is the next chapter of human space exploration. Humans are the most fragile element of this entire endeavor, and yet we go for humanity. We go to the moon and on to Mars to seek knowledge and understanding and to share it with all. We go knowing our efforts will create opportunities that cannot be foreseen. We go because we are destined to explore and see it with our own eyes. We turn towards the moon now, not as a conclusion, but as preparation, as a checkpoint toward all that lies beyond. Our greatest adventures remain ahead of us. We are going. We're going. We are going. We are going. We're going. <clears throat> so you can find any of these um, slides uh, from on the Artemis mission or that video um, on, um, on NASA.gov. You can go look for that. Who's the narrator? Anybody recognize the voice? Captain Kirk, that's right, <laughs> William Shatner. Um, uh, most of the information that I used today came from this uh, How Apollo Flew to the Moon by W. David Woods. That's a fascinating read. It's, it's really interesting. Uh, this guy's done a lot of research, obviously, and figured out how all the, the systems worked. Uh, you can go to this NASA technical report server, uh, sti.nasa.gov, and if you're interested in, in that uh, uh, technical memo that I got most of the info from, 
uh, most of the other info from uh, look at the um, look for cert unified S band system at Apollo in real time org. They have an Apollo 11. I think there's an Apollo 17 out there too. I don't know about all the other missions, but I need to go check that. And then the QST. And if you want to explore the moon yourself, go to Quick Map. If you do this, just Google Quick Map. You'll probably find it. Uh, but it's quickmap.lrock.asu.edu. There they have taken all of the lunar reconnaissance orbiter data, that's um, maps and you know imagery, thermal data, elevations, all of that kind of stuff, and put it on there and you can just zoom around. It's kind of like Google Earth, but it's for the moon. And um, there's really good scientific information there, but it, it's really interesting to be able to see that. And zoom in on the Apollo sites and you can see where the um, descent module is sitting and where the tracks for the rovers were. And you can even see tracks where the astronauts walked because it disturbs a regolith enough to, to change the, uh, the brightness or the albedo. Um, and then there's something kind of similar called trek.nasa.gov uh, as well. So, um, so th th this is an exciting time. It was an exciting time 50 years ago, but it's a pretty exciting time now. Uh, we just have to keep the momentum up and, and, you know, keep the funding and all of that kind of stuff. But uh, we really got, I think, a, a, a workable plan here. And by using what they learned from Apollo, I kept thinking that I, I sit in the meetings where, where we're talking about what's it like on the moon now. We've got at least from a few sites, from six sites, you know, what the properties of, of the lunar uh, uh, environment is like, which is kind of my job. Um, but also we have enormous amount of data from this Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, we, we have very detailed maps of the South Pole now and uh, you know, know what the slopes and the crater sizes and rocks and all that kind of stuff are. So I feel like we're ready to go. And then we have the technology that a lot of you guys work on. Uh, so um, I, th I think it's doable and uh, it's an exciting time. So uh, just uh, keep, keep, stay tuned and uh, uh, we'll uh, hopefully be able to pull this off. So that's all I have. Any questions? Thank you, sir, for the, uh, the history and the future of the space exploration. Uh, my question is, when you land on the South Poles with the permanent uh, shadows, how will you get uh, solar energy there to power the equipment? Yeah, that's, that's, that's obviously a problem. We can't um, land in one of those craters. I think they're going to have to land on one of the the permanently illuminated, or they call it um, perpetual illumination or something, uh, regions nearby, and then probably send robots down into those craters. Uh, yeah, the spacesuits aren't designed for that kind of cold, and um, so that it'll be a while before anybody goes down in one of those craters uh, or any hardware goes down there. But the idea is to land nearby, and, and then you're, you're close enough that you can have your other assets, bulldozers and such, go down and, and, and bring back the water. While I ask, Daniel, can you please start setting up your, your gear? Um, so you had a really cool thing, I thought, the, um, like the participation of hams like during the original Apollo mission. So I'd be curious to know, like, will the Artemis you know, mission have any opportunity for hobbyists or you know, enthusiasts just to get involved, or, you know, just observe, or you know, any, any kind of in participation? And maybe even something that we can, you know, I would say there's probably ex experts here, but we could maybe take elsewhere, like into schools and, you know, something like that. Is there anything like that? Well, you know that um, the, um, it started with, with shuttle, the shuttle amateur radio experiment, or SARX, and then on space station we had this amateur radio on ISS. This has been very popular. I think there are plans to put something like that on Gateway. Uh, it won't be something you can use your two meter handy talkie to talk to over that distance. I, I, what I've heard, it may be X-band, and it'll probably be some digital uh, form of communications. I don't know the the details of that. So um, that'll be specifically for amateurs. Uh, I think the, the comm system will probably be pretty similar to, uh, to what's used on Space Station now. So that's probably K, KU band. I know it's K band anyway and some S band. Um, so I don't know how much hobbyist involvement there can be there like there was back then where they could actually hear the FM signal. Uh, but um, uh, certainly there's, there are plans for um, you know, amateur radio on the gateway. I haven't heard anybody talk about amateur radio on the lunar module. I think weight is at such a premium there that uh, that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. But sometime it, it, it possibly could. So uh, I would love to have a repeater on the moon, right? So that would be great. 
Hi, thanks for the talk. So you're, uh, when you're talking about the gateway module, I noticed one of your bullets was specifically about designing around and incorporating uh, open architectures and frameworks, uh, which obviously this conference is all about. Right. Uh, so I, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about that and what NASA's thoughts are and their role in the open source community. What I have seen so far, uh, it, it was not in the software area, but it was, um, I, they've got a set of standards that they, they put together for any hardware that goes to Gateway, and those are open standards. Now that's like life support systems and, and command and data handling and um, you know, the, the type of ethernet they're gonna use and all that. Um, I think probably this, on this, most of the software, that's all you know, flight software and that's very rigidly controlled. Although I think, aren't they using Linux on Space Station now? I, I think I heard that some of the laptops may be, uh, may be Linux. I'm not positive about that, don't quote me please. Um, but um, uh, that's when I've heard, I think that bullet was addressing specifically those standards that were put out that are, they're kind of hardware standards primarily. But I, I don't know, that's, that's a good question and that's something that uh, uh, we may want to think about. I'm not sure who to ask about that, but um, I, I know that the, the type of horsepower you have in, in the room here could really contribute to that, you know, the whole program and, and we need that kind of horsepower, so yeah. Hi, uh, I heard NASA done some tests of uh, high bandwidth communications using lasers. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I don't know much about that. I, I know that the LADI mission, which I had some involvement with, that's a Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer. I think it had a laser comm system. Uh, and again, I'm not a communications guy, but I hear, you know, discussion of that. And uh, I know that they were talking about, you know, looking at that for Gateway as well, but I really don't know where that is right now. I think it was successful for LADI. If you look up the LADI mission, you probably find some stuff on that, but I think they had some really high data rates, and, you know, so it looked pr very promising. And especially space-to-space -space communication. That's where it really shines, I think, because, uh, no pun intended, because um, you don't need to worry about, you know, getting through the atmosphere, kind of thing, so, yeah. Yes, you sir? mentioned mining water resources on the moon. What, ha how common is this resource on the moon? Is it sustainable? Is it, like, reproducing itself somehow? Or is this something that's eventually gonna run out? Yeah, where it comes from is um, uh, meteoroid impacts, and that's something else that I do in, in my day job, uh, especially cometary material, because there's a lot of water in that. Now, these things are impacting between 10 and 70 kilometers per second, so a lot of it just goes away. But um, there's, there's enough of it. They think the reason that we have that there is because of these impacts, you get the, uh, some of the molecules kind of bouncing around the surface, and these are cold traps. That's a place where it's so cold that if a molecule gets in there, it's, it may stay. And, and so over billions of years, you build up some of that. Um, yeah, if we started mining it you know, really fast, I'm sure we'd use it all up and it'd be gone. But I think it'd take a really long time uh, to do that. There's, it's not really well understood just how much is there. And that's part of the reason for doing this research, you know, sending people there, sending robots down. But from uh, measurements of, of neutrons, coming back up from the surface, and then there's, uh, there was, back in, um, I think, guess it was 2009, the LCROSS mission. That was the upper stage that sent the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter to the moon. They deliberately smashed it into one of these permanently shadowed craters and uh, observed what came out of it uh, from the, a little shepherding spacecraft from the Earth and then from LRO as well. So. Um, we know that there's water there, but I don't think they know exactly how much, or maybe some other stuff there too, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's an area of active research for sure. Any other questions? It looks like there's no more questions. Um, before you walk off stage, I'd like to thank you. Um, we have a reward for all our keynote speakers, our keynote speaker award and our keynote speaker challenger coin. Um, thank you very much for talking. Oh, it was very interesting. It's a pleasure. Another round of applause. Thank you.